Hello and welcome uh, to everyone who has joined us for this interview, uh, which is part of the Cambridge Judge uh, Business School uh, video series, CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. We sincerely appreciate you for joining us uh, today. By way of quick introduction, uh, my name is Stelios Kaladias, uh, and I'm the Margaret Thatcher uh, Professor of Enterprise Studies in Innovation and Growth, as well as the founding director and current co-director of the Entrepreneurship Center here at the Cambridge Judge Business School. We're hugely honored to be joined today by uh, Sir Mene Pangalos, Executive Vice President, uh, R&D uh, Biopharmaceuticals at AstraZeneca, and also an advisory board member uh, here at the Cambridge Judge. Before joining uh, AstraZeneca in 2010, Sir Mene was Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Neuroscience Research at Pfizer and held uh, senior positions uh, in discovery and neuroscience as well at Wyeth Pharmaceuticals and GlaxoSmithKline. Notably, he was awarded a knighthood in the 2020 New Year's Honours for his service to UK um, science. So before I begin this interview, I'd like to obviously extend uh, our sincerest thanks to Mene as a long uh, standing supporter and collaborator of the school and obviously for um, taking part during his busy schedule uh, to be with us uh, today. So welcome, Mene. Thank you very much for joining me in conversation today. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Uh, it goes without saying that we are here at the judge, at the Cambridge Judge Business School, absolutely excited that we have the opportunity of this interview so that we can have uh, an interesting discussion given all the uh, pandemic situation that goes around. And just as a starter of the discussion, Mene, and given how instrumental the role that you're playing within AstraZeneca is, uh, allow me to ask a, a little bit of a current question, if I may say. Are we out of the pandemic woods? Uh, do you think so? And what is AstraZeneca's expectation with respect to that? Look, I think, I think we need to take a step back. I, I think um, we've made tremendous progress, not just in the UK, but in, in, in many countries around the world with the um, development of vaccines uh, that are being implemented um, around the world. Clearly, there's not enough doses for the world yet, but they are being implemented in many regions of the world um, effectively, and they're clearly having um, a very big impact in keeping people um, at risk from getting severe disease, hospital, being hospitalized and, and dying. So I think if you think about the time period in which that has been done, you know, in less than a year, we've got four vaccines now approved, um, you know, in the US, Europe, UK, um, and actually, you know, for our vaccine, it was approved in, in uh, more than 70 countries around the world. I mean, I mean just the, the speed at which that has been done is absolutely remarkable. That in itself is fantastic. We are seeing these uh, variants of concern uh, arising, which I think the vaccines will still be able to deal with in terms of treating severe disease and hospitalization. But obviously, as, as, as these variants of concern become more transmissible, there's still large proportions of the world and large proportions of our populations that remain unvaccinated. And so you'll continue to see the virus spread and have an impact um, in, 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 in all of the regions around the world until you know, the majority of people are vaccinated um, and we have you know, what's known as herd immunity. So we're not out of the pandemic yet. There's a lot of work to do. Um, you know, if you look at what's happening in India, you look at, you know, there's, there's still a lot of countries in the developing world that need access to vaccines that don't have them. And we need more doses for the developing world as much as for the developed world, because until we're, we're all vaccinated, none of us are going to be safe. Indeed, indeed. And I think, I think at some level, you, you, you're right that we're seeing the light potentially, but we're not fully out, out of the woods. Let me, let me move us a bit uh, back to the roots minute in terms of um, uh, your personal background. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and having such a remarkable career, the trajectory that you've taken thus far? Yes, so first of all, I'm not sure it's a remarkable career, but I thank you for saying that. I, I think um, my, my background is, 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 uh, is re relatively um, simple. I've uh, I studied in the UK, I did my, um, my bachelor's degree in biochemistry at Imperial College, and then I did a PhD um, at an institution called the Institute of Neurology, which is part of uh, University College London. 
Um, I did well in both of those. And then I went and did a postdoc in, in the US. But I knew when I was doing my PhD that I wanted to do applied research. Um, I, I was sponsored by um, Merck, Sharp and Dome. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing the environment that uh, those scientists and pharmacologists were working in. I got a real taste for how you can turn science into medicine or try and turn science into medicine. Um, so I knew that's that's what I wanted to do. So I was lucky in that regard that I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and my supervisor at the time, um, a professor called Derek Middlemiss, who was at Merck, said to me, you know, go and do a postdoc somewhere abroad. And once you've done that, then you can come back and, and you can go wherever you want. You can have an academic career, an industrial career, go and do medicine. I mean, he said, you, you just basically the world would be your oyster. So I went off to America, did a postdoc. Um, and then from there, started to apply for positions in, um, in, in companies. I, got a, I was very lucky that I, someone took a risk of me at Johnson & Johnson, actually, in Belgium. And I got a, a team leader position at J&J, a relatively young career in a new group that was building a molecular biology group, did well there. Then came back to SmithKline Beecham, which became GlaxoSmithKline. And then, as you said, I went to Wyeth to run neuroscience, and ended up heading running research after. Um, five years and then came back to AstraZeneca but the, probably the, the, the journey is probably one about um, not being afraid to, to jump to take a risk to go into different countries experience different cultures different techniques I haven't stayed on one thing I've kind of tried lots of different things and sort of you know become a um, knowledgeable about quite a few different topics um, and also been able to take the jump of you know even when I you know when I was doing well at Johnson and Johnson to take an opportunity that came up for me back in the UK and then when I was doing well in the UK to take an opportunity when it arose to go to the US and then when I was doing well in the US to take an opportunity that came up to come back to the UK to work for AstraZeneca and through all of those opportunities it would have been very easy to stay I wasn't unhappy where I was I wasn't doing badly I was actually doing very well I could have had good careers at each step, but I think each of those steps has been, has felt uncomfortable. You know, could I do the next job? Could I do the next level? Um, and it would have, in, in many regards, been easier to stay. Um, but, you know, I chose to jump and hope that the parachute would open and, uh, and I would land safely, which and thankfully it did uh, in, in all of those situations. But I, I think that what I say to people when they ask me is don't be afraid to take risks with your career in terms of going to different countries, experiencing different things and broadening your horizons as much as you can, particularly early on in your career, because it just gives you that much more experience such that when you get more senior roles, you can interact and engage with people from different disciplines and different areas more easily. Well, I, I have to admit that sounds like a remarkable career, but I'll go past the point. So, so the journey brings you to AstraZeneca almost uh, a decade ago, right? 10 years ago, yeah. more or less now. Yeah. Um, in, in, your, in your mind, how did the company look like back then? And how do you think the company has changed over this last decade? Man? Yeah, so it was, um, look, I mean, AstraZeneca has, has got a, a, a rich history and, and has had its ups and downs. When I was recruited into AstraZeneca in 2010, it was going through what I would say uh, a low from an R&D perspective, at least. They actually had you know, very successful brands, but they were coming to their end of their patent life. So even though they were generating a lot of cash, the productivity from the R&D organization, which ult ultimately sustains the company in terms of its growth, was not good. Um, and so my job coming into the company was to try and you know, reinvigorate and reshape research and development and try and get it to be productive again. Um, we did a piece of work when I first joined, trying to understand the decisions that were being made across the pipeline um, from the previous five years to try and understand why we were where we were. Um, and we looked at about 300 projects and it was, it was very interesting. You know, we were spending about $5 billion a year in research and development. And if you measured us by the numbers of things that we did, the numbers of candidates, the numbers of INDs, the number of, uh, of, of lead optimization programs. We were one of the most productive companies in the world. But if you measured us by the output that mattered, and for me, the only output that matters, which is numbers of medicines or agents approved by a regulator, 
in a new indication, we were the second least productive company in the world. So even though the R&D scientists were getting rewarded and recognized and you know, supposedly having good years and in inverted commas, when you actually looked at the output, which is medicines, we were hugely unproductive. Um, so there was two things there. You know, the, the scientists were being rewarded for volume, not quality. Um, and they were actually being incentivized from my perspective incorrectly because they were being recognized and rewarded for the volume of what they were doing, not for the quality of what they were doing. So we set up a framework as a consequence of all of this analysis. Um, we set up a framework that was focused on five things that we believed would improve the chances of us being able to turn science into medicine, just slightly stack the deck in our favor, you know, a little bit more than, than it had been before. And they're very obvious intuitive things, right? Target and understanding the biology of the disease that you're working on and the pathways that you're picking and trying to constantly prove or disprove your hypothesis to increase your confidence as you're moving through or decrease your confidence so you stop a program, right? Safety, understanding safety issues before they become problems so that you weed them out so that it don't become expensive problems in the clinic. Um, right tissue, making sure that when you have a molecule that's meant to, for example, block a receptor in the brain, that you know that molecule gets into the brain. So you actually have a chance of testing your hypothesis. Right patient, defining the patient population that's most likely to respond to modulating that particular mechanism in that disease. Because if it doesn't work in a subset of patients that are targeted to that particular pathway, it's not going to work in a broad population. And then right commercial, not what is it, a billion dollar peak year sales drug, but why would anyone want to pay for the medicine? Why would anyone want to prescribe the medicine? What are the comparators you have to use? So we built up this framework and you know, over five years, our success rate went from um, what it was when I first joined, which was 4%. So from going from first in human to launching a drug through different phases, we have different phases of drug development, our industry, just to, again, for a bit, bit of context, is lousy at this. You know, we're, we're very good at failing as an industry. The industry success rates during that period were around 5 to 6%. So, we, you know, industry fails 95% of the time when it moves molecules into the clinic through development. We were worse than industry averages. We were around 4%. But when we implemented the five R's after five years, when I look at the, um, the metrics, we, we pushed ourselves up to... Um, around a 16% success rate. Um, so really a, a significant improvement and actually one of the top performing companies. And actually, if you look at our success rates now, um, we're over 20%. And actually in Biofarm, we're close to 30%. We're actually, I think about 31%. So still very good at failing, exceptionally good at failing. We're still failing 70% of the time, but that's a lot better when you're spending $6 billion a year than when you're failing 95% of the time. So... And, and that, of course, is translated into us launching a lot of new medicines, revitalizing the company, re revitalizing the direction of the company. You know, we're now viewed as being one of the you know, best investment opportunities and also one of the fastest growing pharmaceutical companies uh, in the industry. So I think we've done a, we've, we've done a, a good job. I think we, we, we will never be complacent. There's still much we have to work on to improve. We can talk about that if you want. But um I think directionally we've, we've been moving in the right direction over the past decade. Um, and I'm you know, very proud of the group in terms of what we've done. So, so given that you, you brought up the, the issue about never being complacent, I think over the last year we could only say that, that there was a good opportunity to showcase that we can be complacent, right? So, so coming a bit closer to what we're living now after all this journey of improving the, the R&D productivity that you described, COVID breaks out, uh, pivotal moment, everybody tries to find, the pharma industry is at the epicenter of this, and, and we come into a big achievement, in my view at least, which was the vaccination process, right? Yeah. Could you give us a bit of a glimpse on what this last year and a half, year, year and a half has been for AstraZeneca, as well, given that as a company, you, you were at the epicenter, I mean, you, you are one of the big fighters against this, right? And how, yeah. how the pandemic has affected the rest of the research that you have been undertaking then? Yeah, so let's, I think uh, there's two questions there. And actually, I think um, the first one's in, and I'd like to answer it if I can in, in, in two phases because they're, they're, they're different questions. So the first is, how did we manage the pandemic, right? What did we you know? What was our response to the pandemic? And it's actually quite interesting. So I think 
the culture that we've talked about in terms of you know, focusing on quality, not quantity, um, thinking about those five R's um, has, has transformed our culture as a company in terms of how we approach R&D. Um, and so that, that I think is right. But if I, if I take a step back to sort of November, December 2019, right, when we, you know, we have a, a, a you know, big business, we have a very big business in China. And so we started to become aware of the virus in China, and of course, initially, we're thinking about how to help our Chinese colleagues, but very quickly realized that this wasn't going to be a China problem. This is going to be a global problem with borders not closing and just seeing how this thing was spreading. Um, we very quickly started to think, you know, holy crap, what are we going to do? Um, and so we, we had three approaches that we, we could take. Um, one was taking our existing molecules in our pipeline and thinking how we could reposition them to treat COVID. And we had three different programs, three different molecules that we were looking at, actually four, four or five different molecules. So those are kind of all the repositioning things. Then obviously the other thing we had to do is make sure that our existing medicines, our oncology medicines, our asthma medicines, our kind of asthma medicines continue to get made and delivered around the world and we haven't missed a day of supply. But to do that, we had to set up testing, uh, diagnostic testing in our facilities. So we actually set it up PCR testing in, in our labs, in our sites. And as a consequence of that, we also then also set up PCR testing in the UK in particular uh, with one of the Lighthouse Labs working in partnership with Cambridge University. So that became a sort of offshoot of that. We were actually testing for the UK government. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, immediate type stuff. Then we looked at our drug discovery platforms and said, look, we've got really good antibody capabilities. Let's try and make some antibodies to this virus. So we created two monoclonal antibodies, which are uh, targeting um, SARS-CoV-2, two different regions of SARS-CoV-2. The difference is that our antibodies are intramuscular injections versus intravenous. And we've engineered um, a domain of the antibody, which is called the FC domain, with something that extends the half-life of the antibodies in the body so that when you take them, we think they're going to enable people to be protected for between at least 12 months. And that's very important because whilst the vaccines are fantastic, there are going to be people that break through uh, vaccinations in terms of getting infected, but there are also going to be people that don't respond to vaccinations, people that are immune suppressed, people that are on chemotherapy, some people that may be a frail or, or old and don't get a good immune response. So that was the second thing that we did um, in terms of uh, therapies. And then finally, because of the work that we were doing in testing and with the antibody, I was part of conversations with the Vaccines Task Force and with various um, UK stakeholders. And we heard about the Oxford vaccine and they were looking for a partner. And so I spoke to John Bell and then I spoke to Pascal. I said, you know, I think we could potentially help Oxford um, in terms of being able to globalize this vaccine, you know, run, help them run the pivotal studies, help them file around the world, but um, importantly, help manufacture. And so um, within a few weeks of those first discussions, we've signed an agreement with Oxford to do, um, you know, what is now the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, a not-for-profit, um, and you know, as you know, manufacture it now around the world and you know, and provide it to to many countries and many regions, and you know, with with now you know, three two two successful phase three programs. So that's kind of the totality of what we did. And what I would say is, to me, it's a testament of I think the you know, being willing to take risks, being able to move quickly. I mean, the speed at which these things have been done, you know, whether it's the antibodies or the vaccines or the tech, I mean, these, these have been done remarkably, remarkably fast at a time when everything was in lockdown. So, to, you know, I'm super proud of our group and I think it has been remarkable. I think to me it's a testament of our ability to take risks, to jump on new technologies, to not be afraid to do things um, and to be nimble and flexible and agile in terms of our decision making. Now, that's kind of the, the, the vaccine stuff. And the, the next bit, and that was like our night job, not our day job, because our day job was to deliver the rest of the pipeline in oncology and kind of asthma metabolic and respiratory and immunology, et cetera. And that all had to continue while we were doing all of the vaccine stuff. Um, so when I say people have been working 24-7 for you know 12 to 16 months, um, I'm not exaggerating. It really has been like that. Um, and we have a lot of, you know, very tired, but very proud people um, in the organization. But 
what the pandemic has also made us do is it, it, we've had to sort of accelerate our digital journey. And in the next day, we've spoken about digital and the impact that sort of digital transformation can have on our business and the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is taking its time to get there. It's accelerated that digital transformation quite aggressively because we've had to learn how to run clinical trials remotely without patients going into sites to see physicians. We've had to work out to get our medicines straight to the patients, straight to their homes, instead of doing it to, to hospitals. We've had to work out how to use digital apps to be able to communicate and you know and interact with patients to get the endpoints um, in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And so much of our digital journey, I think, has been you know has been accelerated as a consequence of this. And indeed, we've we've started to run fully randomized registry studies in a digital way now for some of our phase three programs that we wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think that's been, you know, maybe one of the silver linings has been that, you know, our digital journey has been accelerated. And I do think ultimately that will make our industry uh, more efficient, more nimble, a bit more flexible. Um, you know, it comes with a you know foundational cost in terms of improving your IT infrastructure. But I think over time it will it will continue to help the transformation of our industry in terms of how we engage with patients, with physicians, and how we run um, our clinical studies. Indeed, it, it sounds it sounds impressive. Just when somebody thinks about the timeline of um, how quickly a new vaccine was brought forward by really really having very adverse conditions, and, and at some level, I'm, I'm echoing what you said. I mean, I think many industries were challenged by the on the digital capacity, but but particularly the pharmaceuticals had an opportunity to really rethink about many, many different dimensions. Now, if I if I shift the question, many a bit more to the leadership side of it, to, to the personal leadership side of this. So what do you think were the biggest challenges for you as a leader, as somebody who's leading a big chunk of, of the organization, right, um, during this last year? And how, how do you think you overcame these challenges? What were the lessons out of the pandemic for leading an organization? And is there, is there stuff that you, you think that you're going to leverage in the future as personal capabilities to manage the, the organization in a better way? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. I'm, I think we're still, we're still managing through it, Stelio, in all honesty. I think I wouldn't say we've... We, we, so we've learned how to manage virtually. We've learned how to do Zoom calls and team calls. And I do my coffee chats now with 10 people on a Zoom call instead of, you know, having cupcakes and uh, and coffees which has been great for my waistline <laughs> um <laughs> but you know like so i think that, that you know that's what we've learned how to do we've learned how to be able to interact and engage with people virtually like this instead of having to do it face to face if you ask me what i prefer i prefer face to face now will we go back to you know traveling every day of the week and you know personally me being on an airport flying to the us flying to china flying to europe you know, going around the UK. I hope not. I think I've realized that I can do some things virtually. Um, and so we will temper the face-to-face -face and intersperse it with virtual interactions. You know, we're having a lot of conversations right now about what our new normal is going to be in terms of face-to-face -face versus virtual. You know, working from home, working from the office. I do think there's a, and I'm sure we'll talk about the new site in Cambridge that I hope will be in in the next few weeks. But to me, there is something important about our culture in, in, in our company, at least, where teamwork, collaboration, being side by side with each other and sort of feeding off each other and, and, um, and innovating together in a room, I think is important. I think that's a very difficult thing to do on a Zoom call, right? I think, you know, for, for the relationships that you have in place, it's great, right? You can keep in touch with people. There are definitely things that you can do. But in terms of ideation, innovation, building camaraderie, you know, think about all the, new, the thousands of new stars we've had in the company that still haven't met any of us face to face. You know, I think that, that I think that's horrible, actually. Um, and I don't think you get you get the real sense of a company or an individual or a team virtually. I don't think you can grab it. We don't see people's body language. You don't see people's facial expression. I mean, it's, it's just, I, I just don't think it's as good. So I, I think there's going to be a place for virtual meetings. And I think we are going to be working more virtually than we were. Will we become a, you know, 
a, a fully virtual company working from home, not coming to the workplace? No, I don't think we will. I think we'll be predominantly a team based, face to face based company that will use virtual meetings and virtual interactions to complement um, our normal way of working. Um, no, I don't think we'll be like some of the banks that have said they're going to be fully face to face. Um, I don't think we'll be like some of the uh, companies that are saying they're going to become fully virtual. We're going to, I think, be a healthy hybrid of the two. Um, and I think they're both important. But, you know, clearly we've learned how to manage, you know, to a degree virtually. But I do miss the face to face interactions and what they bring um, in terms of being able to get to really see people, walk the labs, see what's happening in, you know, in our different sites. But I'm not, not going to miss being at an airport every week, I have to say. So doing that in a slightly more disciplined way, I think will be, uh, will be, will be helpful. My makes, kids will be happy as well. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. I, I can, I can echo that much, you know, in, yeah. in, in, in that respect, you, you mentioned, you mentioned on, on passing there, the, uh, the new site, right. And, and I'll use this as a springboard for my next question, which is around this, this big move that AstraZeneca undertook around 2012, 2013, right. Of moving the headquarters here in Cambridge. And actually the, the new site is sort of the, the um the living proof that really you thought yes. about Cambridge as the global headquarters, right? How yes. has this move benefited you think AstraZeneca? But also what's your perspective about the broader business ecosystem in the UK in Cambridge? I mean, how do you think that this interaction has played out? Look, I think the, the move to the move to Cambridge and again and I'll go I'll go back just for a moment if I can to the, the five R's and sort of where we were 2005, 2010 to where we are now. And, and uh, for those people that like sport, I used to have I have a sporting analogy that I actually got from my head of discovery science. So I, I I used to go around lab when I first joined the company. I used to go around the labs and we did poster sessions and science sessions. And of course, I had the I was lucky that I'd worked in many different a few different many a few different companies. I'd been at Wyeth, which became Pfizer. I'd been at GSK, so I've seen quite a lot of programs and, and research. And I remember going around many of the poster sessions and people would be very proud. This is the best thing that they'd ever done. And, uh, and, uh, and they would call it world-class. And I would say, well, how do you know it's world-class? They'll go, well, it's the best thing we've ever done. And, and the analogy I, I, I set, actually based on a comment that Mike used to say was, we were very good at personal bests. Um, we weren't setting any world records. And, we were, and, and so our comparisons were always internal ones, always inwardly looking ones. Is it the best that we've ever done versus is it the best in the world? And the way I've tried to shift our organization is to try and start setting world records. Uh, I'm not so interested in personal bets. I'm interested in world records. And the way you set world records is by competing in the world stage, right? You compete in the Champions League, not just the Premier League. You compete in or, or the, 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 the Super League, <laughs> you, um, right? So, so you really, you want to be competing with the very best people out there. So how do you do that? Well, you do that by collaborating with the very best people out there and making sure that your work is, is viewed and recognized. So you do that by publishing. And when you look at the publications that we've had coming out of our group, um, you know, I would compare us now to any of the top academic groups or any of the top companies in terms of the number of nature and science and cell papers um, that we publish every year. Uh, and by doing that, by having postdoc programs, by having PhD students, by recruiting young graduates, you, you basically start to have this, um, this network and infrastructure of a, of a global AstraZeneca brain that includes all of your collaborators. Uh, and the move to Cambridge is very much part of building and even, you know, um, gaining even more traction and momentum doing that. So we came to Cambridge because we wanted to be in one of the premier places in the UK in terms of scientific acumen, scientific innovation, but also the opportunity to do scientific partnership, not just for the UK, but if you actually put, look at Cambridge and Cambridge, Oxford, London, you know, one of the best places in the world to do that. And of course, the building in itself, where we've positioned it and how we've built it to be glass, to be porous, to have coffee shops that anyone can come into. It's all about making it a collaborative space, not just for our own scientists, but for scientists at the LMB, for scientists at Adam Brooks, for scientists at the Cancer Institute. And that, I think, is part, is part of the culture that we've tried to build. And we've tried to build it not just in Cambridge, but in Gothenburg, in Gaithersburg, by bringing biotechs into our campuses and really trying to 
establish ourselves as a great academic and scientific partner with anyone that works with us, where we give as much as we take in terms of that scientific innovation. Um, and when I look at, and just to give an example, when I look at the collaborations and partnerships we have now with labor laboratories for molecular biology, when we first moved to Cambridge, people said to us, you are never going to be able to collaborate with the LMB. They are too smart and they are too, in, too focused actually on what they're doing. They don't need an industrial partner. Um, and so we set up this, you know, when John Savile was head of the MRC, I went and saw him and I said, you know, let's try and see if we can create a small fund, right, where we make it really easy for the PIs to collaborate and where the only collaborations we fund are ones that are 50-50 partnerships between AZ scientists and LMB scientists. And it took a little bit of time, but we probably have now partnerships and collaborations with nearly half of the PIs at the LMB. Um, which to me is absolutely incredible, right? And we're publishing together and we continue and, and it's something that we're now renewing as in its uh, second round. Um, and Jan, who's the current MRC director, is, you know, is highly supportive, um, as is Fiona Watt, the head of the MRC, as am I. And to me, it's, I think, an example of what we're trying to do, which is it doesn't all have to be applied research and that it's got to lead to you know drug discovery it's got to be applied research and that we're thinking about how we can advance technologies we can advance knowledge and understanding and ultimately we publish it and and, and both get something out of it so i'm i'm hugely excited by these types of partnerships we do them at the karolinska institute we do them at mb we do them with the 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 the, the, the university hospital we do them with john hopkins um and these are the types of partnerships to me that help drive world records not personal bests very good very interesting i mean i can i can attest that much and i'm looking forward to the new site by the way that you're building given that i'm living not as much world. as i am still i can promise you're not looking forward to it as much as i am given how the lady i know i know i can <laughs> i can right. i can tell that much and actually i'm looking forward to grabbing a coffee because it's just walking yeah. distance from where next I next month really i'm cool. gonna be in next month i'm gonna we're gonna have our first 200 people in next month so I'm, uh, it's gonna be phenomenal and hopefully I'm not, going to use the interview. I'm not going to use the interview to 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 make sure that i get to see you there Benny, but I'll, I'll, mm. I'll try as much as i can so so let me let me come to uh, sort of my last question okay which yeah. is around looking into the future i, I think we we're, were just it seems that we're seeing the end of the light in the end of the tunnel we the are, light, we are. Actually, right and and a big question that i've been reading a lot about and we at least within the business school context we've been talking a lot about is is the change that's being brought forward in the healthcare system, right? As a result of the pandemic, but in general, how health is going to be um, delivered and, and, and supported in, in, in the future. So do you think that there have been benefits out of the last one and a half year on how we can improve the delivery of healthcare, one thing, but then most importantly, what are the three, four, whatever number you think of, uh, big challenges that lie ahead of us? Yeah, so look, I think... Again, what's been, I think, exceptional about the pandemic and when I think about the vaccines or the antibodies or, you know, steroids that have been used, you know, that have been approved very quickly um, in, in intensive care COVID patients is the, the collaboration and partnership between so many different groups, right, between, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, between governments, between regulators, uh, between healthcare providers, We've all worked together in, you know, in parallel. We've taken risks together, um, and I think ended up with, you know, highly effective, safe vaccines in in a, in a time period that you know no one would ever have anticipated. I think if you'd said at the beginning of the pandemic that by within 12 months you're going to have um, two approved monoclonal antibodies, you're going to have three or four vaccines, you're going to have how many you know, 60 million people vaccinated in the UK, uh, however many hundred million people vaccinated, I think people would have said you were, you know, you were crazy, right, in terms of the ambition, but we've done it. And it really has, but I was talking to somebody um, a few days ago, um, and he said, you know, you guys have, have, have landed on the moon, right? It really has been a moonshot and you've delivered it in terms of the speed at which you've done it. And I think it's truly remarkable. And I hope that some of that rubs off in terms of how we continue to work with regulators and, and governments um, and healthcare providers, not just for COVID 
medicines, but for cancer medicines and COPD medicines and diabetes medicines and heart failure medicines. Now, of course, it won't be with the same intensity. It won't be, I think, quite with the same flexibility, but I think some of it will rub off on us in terms of how we engage and, 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 and how we interact. Um, but the other things that I think, you know, are clear is, you know, our industry, the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, I think countries have realized and regions have realized how important it is, how important it is in terms of fundamental innovation, but also how important it is for manufacturing capacity, and particularly advanced manufacturing. If you want to manufacture oligonucleotide-based vaccines, if you want to manufacture adenoviral-based vaccines, you have to have a manufacturing capacity, which many countries and regions re realize they don't have. Um, I think if you look at how we're using data, um, data science and artificial intelligence to predict outbreaks, to predict where those outbreaks are going to be, to predict where you should be running your clinical trials, it's been hugely challenging. These are all things that we've learned. And of course, we've been using data science and AI to try and help us predict that a little bit. Um, but I think that will be something that we continue in the future. You know, how do you use data science and AI to help determine your endpoints, to help determine where you should be running your studies, to help determine uh, whether your studies should be reading out or not. Um, there, there are many, I think, examples of, of, of how we can use these applications um, and this data to, to better inform what we're doing in development, to better inform actually even what we're doing in research as well, in a way that I think will improve our success rates and our productivity. Um, I think digital health is the other piece. Is just we're we're starting to use endpoints now because out of necessity, because we can't have let's say a a, um, a diabetes patient come into the hospital and have their blood test. So we're thinking about how we can do that at home, how we can measure using devices, let's say blood glucose, twenty four seven. How we can get an asthma patient to go and you know do a spirometry test at home instead of having to do it in a hospital because it's you know, too risky for them to go into hospital because they don't want to catch COVID. So all of these types of things, I think, are changing a little bit how we work and how we, you know, how we change our endpoints, how we change, how we measure our endpoints to, to ultimately, again, hopefully make us more effective. I actually make it a better patient experience as well because the patients um, have less burden on them in terms of their travel to, you know, to clinical trial sites, et cetera. Um, so I do, I do think um, our industry is, changing rapidly as a consequence of COVID and the pandemic. Um, I think we're changing rapidly how we work. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully regulators and governments will also learn, you know, have also learned about the importance of what we do and the challenges of what we do as well. I think they've learned an awful lot about life, the life science industry the hard way um, you know, as a consequence of the pandemic, which I think, you know, in the long run will hopefully help all of us become more productive and, and enable innovation to get to patients more rapidly than it has before. Very, very, very interesting, very fascinating, I must admit. So, so let, me, let me, I'll stop my questions and interrogation here, if you wish. Uh, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll conclude this really fascinating interview by, by thanking you, Bene, uh, wholeheartedly uh, for joining us today and, and giving part of your time for this uh, discussion. Um, in, in my view, I think you've shared a lot of things with us, uh, a very informative bird's eye perspective on how AstraZeneca has, has achieved stuff so far, um, your amazing journey in terms of your commitment to, to global health and, and also what the future uh, brings forward, which is, is a source of um, optimism and hope, I think, for all of us. Um, I must say that it has been extremely interesting for me personally also to connect with you, and, and I greatly appreciate the fact that you've uh, decided to participate in the CGBS Perspectives Leadership in Unprecedented Times with the Cambridge Judge Business School. So a big thank you, Mene, for that. It's my pleasure. And while I have lots of it, I, I want to just say a big thank you to to everyone in Cambridge. I, I, I want to say, actually, I want you know, public to say a big thank you to all of my colleagues in, in AstraZeneca and all of our collaborators. I think the, the, the level of work and effort to deliver a not-for-profit vaccine at the scale that we've done, the speed at which we've done, um, is, is something that you know is probably a once in a lifetime achievement and deliverable, and um, you know we've you know no doubt we've had challenges, but I just want people to remember you know we have a highly effective vaccine. It's a very cheap vaccine. Um, 
to, to, to make and it's an easier vaccine to distribute. I do think it's going to have a major impact around the world. And I want to thank all of my colleagues in research and development and operations um, in corporate affairs that have really worked so hard to get these agreements in place and to try and make this vaccine as accessible as possible. And of course, all of our collaborators in Oxford as well um, that, have, that have invented and, and, and delivered this. People are, have been working really, really hard. And whilst it's been difficult and challenging and we still have challenges and like many other manufacturers, we haven't delivered what we thought we were going to deliver in terms of um, numbers of doses. I think when you put it into context, the time that it's taken to do it, I think people have done a remarkable, remarkable job and they should all be very, very proud. And, and I think history will look back on what they have all done um, with hopefully a, a, a smile and a, a thank you. Um, like, like you're saying, um, Stelio, and I'm incredibly thankful to be working with some very talented people that have enabled us to do this. So and, thank and you for having me and letting me have the chance to say that for people. Once more, many thanks, uh, Mene. And as always, a big thank you to all our alumni and other members of the CJBS community for, who have decided to join us in this fascinating discussion. So thank you. Keep, keep safe, everyone. Keep well.